I exist as my metabolic self. A series of chemicals. Organisms. Cells. A chain of molecules that materialize the anthropogenic activities that brought them into existence. I absorb. I ingest. I inhale. We move through this world of our own creation. Whilst the microscopic particles we have created pervade our systems. Our landscapes. Our bodies. Floating. Flowing. Melting. Infecting. Disrupting. Dwelling. Within and around us. I became an accumulation. A series of economic transactions. Material extractions. A collection of pharmaceutical decisions. A result of industrial, agricultural and urban processes. I represent clinical tests, social consumption, capitalist expansion, geopolitical boundaries. I endure the self-inflicted tyranny of the post-industrial body. I am an endless series of metabolic relations between humans, more than humans, borders, nations, cells, organs. Substances transgress. I have no boundaries. The body is merely a signaler, a shift from one metabolic condition to another. Ingestion no longer prevails in the confines of the deliberate. We exist amongst and within. Hollows of calcium. Monuments of sulfur. Sedimentary particulate matter. Veins of plastics. Disparities of iron. Constellations of synthetic fibers. Blooms of algae. Domesticated formaldehyde. Showers of Teflon. Systems of vanadium. Plumes of tear gas. River of cadmium. Our bodies are subjugated to the same chemical influx as we have exerted on our environment. Matter is moving through us, and with it, we become the matter. We are primarily engaged with deconstructing the perceived boundaries between matter, bodies, and spaces. We reconsider the metabolic processes that have emerged as a result of anthropogenic activity. We explore the geopolitical, cultural and spatial systems entangled within the post-industrial metabolism. We challenge the idea of externality in the inadvertent ingestion of these new pollutant flows, replacing it with questions around embodiment of toxic substances, which trespass skins, tissues and cells of all shapes, kinds, nationalities and species. Welcome and good evening. We're Claire, Cyprian and Alexa, members of the collective Metabolic Cells. We will be your hosts for this evening's launch event of the Metabolic Cells digital platform. The collective formed in response to an invitation extended to the ADS3 1920 cohort to take part in the Serpentine Gallery's ongoing Back to Earth project. For the anniversary, they have invited artists, architects, poets and filmmakers to devise artist-led campaigns and initiatives responding to the environmental crisis. Metabolic cells are concerned with matters around ingestion and digestion. To ingest in a post-industrial world is an inadvertent act, no longer a process of definitive input for desired output. Rather, ingestion in the Anthropocene reverses this lens, subjugating bodies to the same chemical influx as we have exerted on our environment. When we ingest matter into our bodies, we also ingest a chain of political, cultural and economic signifiers. In order to reach a post-industrial understanding, metabolic selves believe that there needs to be a shift away from considering pollutions and pollutants as external entities. On the launch of our digital platform, we've invited three guests to open up the conversation surrounding topics at the core of our work, the work of metabolic selves. Also during the event, we will be tuning in and out of a musical performance commissioned by us, set in the Carpathian Mountains. The two musicians have recorded audiographic encounters with the digital as well as the natural world and comprised them into a metabolic sound piece. At the end of this event, the Metabolic Cells platform will go live and we invite you all to immerse yourselves in an environment of post-industrial ingestion. So with that, I would like to welcome Hannah Landica, 
our first guest to the conversation tonight. Hannah, who is a historian and sociologist of the life sciences, is both a professor in the Department of Sociology at UCLA in California and director of the Institute for Society and Genetics. Metabolic Cells first spoke with Hannah last October in 2019, in which Hannah played a huge part in shifting our perspectives around metabolizing bodies and conjunctures. So we're super excited to welcome Hannah back into the conversation. Myola, another member of Metabolic Selves, will also be joining the conversation. Hi, Hannah, and welcome. Thank you. It's nice to be here. So, Hannah, I think it would be great to start off the conversation talking about the developments in metabolic sciences and trying to understand how metabolism in the form of ingestion should not only be recognized as an act of energy, but also for information. You have spoken before about the understanding of changes from the 20th century metabolism with the ideas of siloed categories to a more post-industrial understanding where these categories crack open with one another. For example, energy information, metabolism reproduction, and inside outside. Well, I'm a sociologist of science and a historian of science, so I, I spend a lot of time hanging out um, embedded in thinking within um, the, the, the metabolic sciences. And one of the things that I think is so exciting um, about the last, let's say the last two decades or so, with the rise of the microbiome um, with the, the, this sort of sense that when you're ingesting food, you, you're also ingesting microbes and those microbes are um, living uh, and dying in relation to the ones that already live in you and mm -hmm. that the components of food, uh, it's not that they, they, they stop being energy providers or substrate providers, but they can also at the same time be cues. They can also at the same time be signals. They can enter into these communicative relations um, either with the microbes that are already in in the gut or in these relations between microbes that live in the gut and 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 human as as the scientists like to say host cells mm -hmm. right that, that, that there's all of this signaling and crosstalk and and biochemistry which was the science of input output turning this into that is also actually a, a science of understanding these modes of intercellular and intracellular communication. Mm -hmm. So the very idea that food can be informational or communicative as well as being energetic, um, that takes some of those really profound ontologies of the 20th century um, and, 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 as I like to say, cracks them open. And, and I, I use this, this phrase ontological fracturing exactly to push back at the idea that, that when you get some kind of shift or turn, you completely abandon what was there before and have something shiny and new. I do think it's more like you get these fissures in categories and things start to leak and, mm -hmm. and you're left with these fragments and pieces of varying sizes of, of older ontologies that you still have to work with and around um, in, any, in, in understanding anything, in describing anything, in drawing anything, um, yeah. but, but it still allows room for change. No, I was just, just going to say, um, so the whole idea of the interscalar uh, communication between all of these different players, um, one thing that I quite liked about what uh, Hannah was saying is that um, certain things are functioning in the body and you have these control rooms or which, emulated, which are emulated in the factory, which are emulated in many supply chains. But what I quite like about that analogy is that um, once you start to think about the importance of these signalers or these, um, I guess, foods that are giving information, you start to, once you think of them as information, you start to think of them as being very important in the entire network itself. I think that one of the things that that is attractive um, about having it 
be this framework for thinking, or perhaps more importantly, a framework for rethinking, yes, um, is, is exactly what you just said, which is that it, it gives us this expansion, right? That, that ingestion is not just about food, but, but toxins are also metabolized. Metabolism is nonlinear, in, and and it is absolutely um, uh, something that works through organization and compartmentalization and uh, hierarchies and sub hierarchies and sub hierarchies. But they're very they they go in circles. They don't go in lines. Mm-hmm. And so it, it's expansive in the sense that it allows us to think about all kinds of substances in a biochemical. Um, milieu, um, but it's also this way of mixing up how we think one thing causes another. Um, the, these these lines of, of causality that things can can uh, the, the things at the end of the supply chain can impact the uh, where we think the decisions are are made exactly because the circuits of interaction are are so so complexly and circularly connected. Um, it's not just one thing happens here and it echoes all the way down and it happens there. The, those, those kind of directionalities, those 20th century flowchart directionalities are, are mixed up in that way. And suddenly the importance of what happens down at the end of the supply chain, for instance, is as important as what happens in the control room where the mm-hmm. decisions are made and it becomes this almost symbiotic conversation, if it's allowed to be, Mm -hmm. a symbiotic um, relationship, which means that what happens in the control room is affected by what happens at the end of the supply chain and vice versa. How do you make these processes visible? How do you kind of understand that when you put a substance um, such as PFAs into uh, into the environment, how do you understand that you're not putting it onto that one landscape? you're putting it into that landscape that holds no boundaries, your body that holds really no skins, everything is very permeable. Well, I'd like to, I'd like to quote the early 20th century uh, scientists who, who thought that intermediary metabolism was, you know, the, the best thing going and, and they were, they were uh, out to understand every aspect of it. And, and, and said things like the, the ultimate aim of this science is to understand how matter passes through organisms. And they wanted to understand every single conversion, every single reaction, every single enzyme, so that they could understand every single step of what happened to matter when it passed through organisms. And, and I think that we're living through experientially the the sensation that that actually we 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 are organisms passing through matter right it's the mm-hmm. it's the reverse um uh, we we're we're not these these bounded efficient factories that matter is coursing through and it's all about uh, about our factory right but but we are we are these fragile groupings of matter um mm-hmm. moving through dense, dense collections of matter that, that happens to be um, formatted by our industrial histories. So um, we, we might think that we drink the water, right? But we are, we are moving through the water, the water world, um, which has been generated by uh, the ways in which we haven't regulated uh, persistent organic uh, uh, pollutants. Uh, we might think that we breathe the air, and and then you know you can track what happens to oxygen and carbon dioxide in our cells and and input output. But but actually we we move through this this world of air, and right? I mean I I'm in the green world right now, but um, if you look out my window. Um, it's kind of orange out there and these vaporized Californian forests are dense. I mean, it's a really physical feeling, right? It's not, it's not that I'm breathing the air and the air is mine to command, 
right? The, 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 it is a very intense feeling of being breathed by this air, by being breathed by these materials um, that that are in in the in the atmosphere. The underlying condition has been is it, it, it even in its framing the underlying condition, the pre-existing condition, the chronic condition. Uh, um, it's something that is, it's just there in the background. It's the background for other things, but it has, it has really been foregrounded uh, in ways that have made my thinking shift about what I'm doing. Um, so it's interesting to think about the conversation that we had almost a year ago and, and to, to think whether we could even have had the same conversation today, um, mm -hmm. given given those um, changes in in the world around us. Thank you so much, Hannah. Well, um, thank you for your time. We truly yeah. appreciate it. We are really excited to be joined by Susan Shoopley, a UK-based artist and researcher whose work examines material evidence from war and conflict to environmental disasters and climate change. Susan, welcome and thank you for joining us in conversation this afternoon. It's a pleasure. I look forward to the discussion. So we're here to explore how your research-based artistic practice draws reference to the same entanglement of narratives and complex relationships of human and modern human interactions that we as a collective discuss in our call for a metabolic order. As a collective, metabolic selves are primarily engaged in constructing the perceived boundaries between matter, bodies, and spaces. We reconsider the metabolic processes that have emerged as a result of anthropogenic activity and explore the geopolitical, cultural, and spatial systems entangled within the post-industrial metabolism, with an emphasis on the often unrecognized agency and standing of, um, that more than humans have in the post-industrial climate crisis landscape. 
So to begin, um, I would like us to talk about what you call the direct and indirect ways in which other than humans can bear witness and maybe elaborate a bit on the evidential archive these non-human entities might entail. Yes, so happy to do so. So um, I guess a couple of points that are worth mentioning. So um, in my work, the fact that materials, um, you know, harbor trace evidence of events in various ways, uh, which can be sort of decoded and reassembled back into a history, that's really important. And that's the ways I've argued that kind of materials can kind of bear witness. But it's also, I think, um, worth bearing in my, or worth mentioning that um, what's equally important, it's not only the fact that uh, materials can carry trace evidence of their encounters or, uh, you know, with other entities. And there's, you know, an infinite number of these kinds of examples. But what's really important in my work I, is the fact that those materials, when they enter into different sort of situations, often situations of dispute, we can really see the ways in which certain kinds of uh, witnesses are given a lot more credibility than others, certain kinds of testimonial acts. So um, it, that's the kind of crucial point that I'm trying to make in all of the sort of work. Which brings us quite nicely to that, our next question. So this idea of um, the human being as the mediator in terms of this kind of human perspective on um, these materials you talk about. Uh, in your lecture, Earth Evidence, you mentioned the argument the American environmentalist Aldo Leopold makes that we can only be ethical in relation to what we see and that in order to act or intervene, the visibility of injustice is crucial. In many of your artistic works, you utilise devices and senses and use the data to tell a story of injustice. Could you maybe elaborate on the role of this data in giving an artistic visual agency to otherwise invisible narratives? Um, yes, I'll, I'll try and answer that question. So when I was thinking about um, Aldo Leopold's kind of like injunction that, you know, that there's, that action requires a certain degree of kind of visibility. And um, I think most people would tend to agree with that. And you think of all the, human rights campaigns and adv advocacy campaigns, they're always about exposing injustice, right? Exposure is always linked to some sort of like, at least hope for action or a kind of hope for some sort of intervention. So uh, it's really important that images uh, do that sort of very kind of critical kind of work. And I think he, when he was writing, he was also thinking about all the ways in which there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of harms and violence that aren't operating according to the, um, you know, thresholds of human sort of perception, you know, in the context of environmental events, uh, but we can think of computational events, of course, as well, right? So there's a lot of things that aren't organized such that humans can actually see them within the context of the ecological, and, um, and I'm sure your own work looks into this, there's a, there's, you know, there's often a kind of extreme latency in relationship to cause and effect. So therefore, one of the central questions that we uh, as a collective have continuously asked ourselves during this process was how can we learn to see or hear from an other than human perspective? So in this context, how do you kind of see the auditive medium performing? Maybe also how do you let the material talk, I guess, or how do you learn to listen? Obviously, I'm an image maker. That's, a, you know, that's my dominant kind of mode of um, practice. And, but I've really tried to do what I call sort of denaturalize images. And one of the kind of key ways in which I've been doing that is through bringing the acoustic register much more forward, making that much more um, explicit. And when I'm, I talk about denaturalizing an image, it would be, you know, a great example uh, comes to mind because I was just in the Arctic in in, um, in early August. So, you know, um, very, very you know, at high up in the um, about 80 degrees sort of latitude and on a sailboat. And you're in this amazing, almost mythological environment. And 
There's a telecommunications infrastructure. We don't see any of this in that image, right? That image is actually almost like the kind of image that we're familiar with from, um, you know, nature cinema or BBC Planet Earth. We don't see any of the kind of technological apparatus, any of the sort of politics that are saturated in that sort of image. We tend not to have the same kind of preconceptions around sound or sonic experiences as we do with visual, but the sonic also can tap into different bodily sensations and experiences. Um, sound is definitely one of the key ways in which I really try to, as I said, denaturalize the image. Um, you were asking me, oh yeah, you were also asking me about the sort of non-human perspective. Well, I think you've said actually almost three things that are thinking crucial. One, and maybe we tend to often say language when we talk about, you know, what are, you know, how, we, what are the speech acts of things? What kind, you know, and, you know, like even in my own work, you know, you're I'm talking about the testimonial of, you know, non-human entities. So, but I think we have to be really careful when we're thinking about the sort of expressive um, dimension of materials, the ways in which the material world is organizes itself and, you know, is, expressive of its own material conditions, we shouldn't assimilate that to the um, acts of speech making. That's something else I think we should denaturalize because it happens all the time, right? I would say that everything you've said actually answers our next question perfectly <laughs> <laughs> well because we start to explore more um, your role as the artist in relation to this kind of communicating this more than human. So particularly with reference to your exhibition um, regarding the catastrophic oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. But could you maybe elaborate on the idea of aesthetic agency as a human, but also as a non-human concept? Um, so how does nature exerting an artistic agency complement your own artistic work? Yeah, I mean, that's always <laughs> in some way also the question I was was asking myself and continue to ask myself. Mm -hmm. uh, no, in part because uh, the project you're referring to was called Nature Represents Itself, and it was an inquiry into the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico um, that occurred. And um, in part, I was uh, I was sort of confronting um, the, like the challenge in my own work because I I wanted to take. I, I do take, say, materials kind of seriously, and I was trying to argue for the kind of, yeah, the aesthetic kind of agency of the of materials. But I really wanted to make a project that um, put forward this conceptual argument that it was much easier for me to develop, let's say, in my writing practice than in my um, art making practice, right? Because I was, certainly wasn't about to create an oil spill in, in the gallery or something like that. But uh, I resorted to um, producing um, a computer simulation because I thought I need to produce an image that is self-generative, right? An image that produces itself. Um, so I don't want to create the image. No, the image has to sort of emerge from a specific set of kind of conditions and properties. And that's where actually computation was really kind of useful because you can you can use like fluid dynamic kind of software that they use to model fluid dynamics, and then you can assign particles different properties. And in fact, you could assign them the exact properties of the crude oil that was in the gum. Mm -hmm. And also bringing the whole conversation in the end back to uh, the context in which we're doing this project, which is uh, the Back to Earth uh, Seventh Eye campaign. So the Seventh Eye Gallery called this year uh, for the anniversary for new forms of cross-disciplinary environmental campaign. And I guess this is a bit of a tricky question mm -hmm. always. Yes, I would. We would like to ask you where you think you situate yourself in this context. Also, because in the beginning of our conversation, you mentioned that sometimes this imagery calls for action in a way. So, would you understand your work as calling for action or just maybe raising awareness? And also, with recognizing nature's political and artistic agency, could maybe this non human campaign for themselves? Maybe it takes us back to where we began because when we talked about sort of mediators, I do see my work as much as engaged in more um, in forms of mediation and public narration. And, but it's not so much on behalf of an iceberg, for example, but it's more, I, I see my role more mediating the different kinds of knowledge practices, the different modes of expertise. 
So my work is always trying to, in some way, bridge uh, incommensurate sort of modes of knowledge production, right? And and all you know because I focus so kind of heavily in my own practice on the scientific realm and the kind of legal realm. These are two areas with a high degree of um, specialized knowledge, a very specialized language, high degrees of abstraction, in fact, operating there. So I've really tried to produce projects where I'm sort of somehow mediating as narrating these different sort of realms of, of experience, of practice, of knowledge production. That's that's the way that I would sort of characterize or describe my own kind of practice. But I guess that maybe the final point I would say as artists, art can really play a kind of crucial role because the translation isn't from page to page, not like English to French, you know, or, you know, a technical argument with, um, you know, an Excel spreadsheet that will be translated into some sort of like analytical kind of journal article, um, which is, it's not, you know, that's, that's, that needs to happen, of course, but I'm, I'm talking about translating across very, um, say, radically different kinds of uh, experiences. And I think that's one of the things that art actually does really kind of well. So I think at least my, I personally, I feel very strongly that there's a necessity also for artists who are engaged in trying to produce this sort of like, let's say, empathetic, empathetic attachments to the non-material world that we still do that with a high degree of kind of like uh, technical kind of specificity and really kind of situated in, in the sort of like kind of messy politics and context out of which that might arise. Right. It's not just this kind of like uh, emblematic moment. Right. So, yes, thank you very much. Thank you so much. And Freya, thanks. Well, can, uh, good luck with all your work, and it's fa- I think it's fantastic that you're reaching out to so many people, and and uh, I really uh, appreciate the sort of like thoughtfulness with which you're approaching all of this. Yeah.
Hello and welcome. Uh, your hosts for this discussion are Cyprian Boating and Remy Kuparije. And today we're honoured to conclude the series of metabolic conversations with Kumi Naidu. For over 40 years, Kumi has been a lifelong social, economic and environmental justice campaigner and was the executive director of Greenpeace International. Currently, he is a global ambassador for the Pan-African organisation, Africans Rising for Justice, Peace and Dignity, and until recently was the secretary general of Amnesty International. Kumi, welcome and thank you for joining us. We're very excited to delve into your political and humanitarian approach towards environmental activism and in particular disobedience and disruption. Thank you very much. It's so wonderful to be with both of you. Much appreciated, Kumi. We're really, really honoured for you to join us here today. And yeah, we can't wait to get straight into it. So I guess we're going to fly in with the first question. Um, so we've previ previously discussed the role of evidence and accountability with Sh Susan Shipley. Um, for example, um, looking at the way contaminated products within the homes of minorities um, affect their health um, of the people currently living there and the health of future generations onwards. Um, and I'm just wondering, what do you think we can propose um, in regards to these forms of discrimination and injustice that take place to those, um, those minority communities are, who are exposed to these intangible and invisible contaminants? Well, thank you for the very kind introduction, but the use of contaminated products, irrespective of whether it impacts on minority and majority communities, is a crime. It must be addressed with urgency. And of course, it's true that minority communities, people of color, working class communities, and so on, are usually, whether it's in China or whether it's in the United States, they are on the receiving end of such um, exploitation for profit. So how do we address this in the current moment? The good news is there's some exciting things happening. What is needed is for us to be able to hold them account. The difficulty we have is that far too many countries in our world, the people that own our governments are in fact those very industries that are driving us to climate destruction. Absolutely. And I actually liked what you're discussing just then about making profit, because this actually draws into an introduction of yourself as well, because the idea of environmental justice focuses on the fair distribution of environmental benefits and burdens. And in the age of industrial capitalism, where costs are being cut to make profits, there's been an increased mistreatment of people in relation to race, in relation to na national origins and their income also. I would love for you to elaborate on your connection between human rights and the work for campaigning for environmental justice and um, how it often targets minority communities. I'll tell you to you in a story. Right? Mm -hmm. So when I was joining Greenpeace in 2015, I didn't have a profile as an environmental activist. I was involved in democracy, activism, economic, social, uh, cultural rights, mainly gender equity and so on. And when I was doing interviews with newspapers in the, with the media in the first days at, as head of Greenpeace, people ask me, oh, so I see you've left poverty and human rights and gender equality and you're moving to environment. I said then and I say now that the struggle to avert catastrophic climate change and to prevent environmental collapse and the struggle to ensure that people have decent homes decent nutrition and a decent health care, so they don't live in poverty, must, can, and should be seen as two sides of the same coin. Without one, you do not have the other. What the women's movement taught us about a long time ago when they said what we need is intersectionality. When the feminist movement introduces word, which is not the easiest of words, let's uh, admit, but it's a very powerful concept. It's saying, for example, as a women's movement, if you want to advance gender equality, you needed to understand how gender interacted with race, class, religion, and so on. Because nobody exists with one identity, right? You know, human beings are complex beings, right? You know, uh, when I found myself in 2009 as the head of Greenpeace, I found the head of the Global Trade Union Movement, an amazing woman, Sharon Burroughs, who said very, very powerfully, he said, Secretary General, why I, as a trade unionist, have to be engaged in the struggle to end catastrophic climate change is because there are no jobs on a dead planet. And there's no metabolism in a dead planet too, maybe. <laughs> so basically, to separate human rights and environmental justice 
or to even separate any other course with its indigenous rights, gender justice, and so on, is a tactical, strategic, and uh, I would even say a moral error. And when we have crises, crises are good things, actually. You know, the Chinese have um, the same character for opportunity is also crisis. I think it's called Wai Chi, okay? Mm -hmm. And we can turn crises into opportunities if there is political will to do that. But in 2008, 2009, when the crisis ended, what did we get? We had system recovery, system protection, system maintenance. When what we needed then and what we need now, as we move out of Corona, hopefully we move out of Corona soon, we need system innovation, system redesign and system transformation. Yeah, most definitely. Like that necessity for more, um, more crossover and more interlinked thinking between people of their own sort of body and the beings around them, as well as um, non-humans or more than humans, I think is incredibly necessary for the level of accountability that each nation must now take for this climatic catastrophe, which seems to be looming in the not too distant future. Because I've been doing some reading um, on a book called Imperial Lever from Anne um, McClintock, I believe. Um, and she's talking about the sort of um, the crossover of race um, race, um, religion, uh, gender, and how these have all been used and mechanized by um, British imperialism to really capitalize and subject these, um, these bodies or beings who are deemed lesser than those dominant powers. There is an unbroken thread of suffering, exclusion, exploitation, and pain that stems from, that, that arises from the period of slavery, colonialism, and runs right into the present. On the other hand, I would also say, there is an unbroken thread of privilege that runs from slavery, colonialism into the present. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Going back to uh, quite a lovely sentiment you said before, where crisis is the same as opportunity, opportunity comes from crisis. I want to kind of use another synonym of crisis, chaos, for example, chaos, disruption, disobedience. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that this could be uh, this could be pushed forward? For example, in design schools, do you think we can start to encourage design that disobeys and kind of disrupts the systems we see now and kind of forces that sort of a change and sort of a outcome? Or do you think, for example, in the case of environmental issues, the, the kind of phenomena we see, such as algal blooms, that the natural environment is doing, if you like, a natural protest, is enough for us to frame that and use that as a, as a kind of a shock factor? So why we need to do that? You are suggesting we need to think out of the box. In fact, you're suggesting correctly that we not only need to think out of the box, we have to take the box and throw the entire box and really start imagining in a different way. Yeah, yeah. I want to evoke a wisdom that has helped me so much. Martin Luther King. When I was about four months old, he was giving a speech and he said, my friends, as I come to the end of my talk, I want to note that in the field of modern child psychology, there's a very dominant term called maladjusted. Now, all of us want to live a well-adjusted life and not suffer from schizophrenia or mental illnesses. But my friends, I say to you, there are certain things in our world that are so unjust and immoral that good, decent people should refuse to be well-adjusted. So basically, it's about not accepting a status quo that is broken. Yeah. Now, I dodge your question about the, which was a very tough one about yeah. whether nature, nature is, is, is fighting back. That's yeah. the way I understood the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, uh, so let me just say a few things about that. You know, while COVID and other extreme uh, weather events can be seen as nature fighting back, mm -hmm. I'm not sure about whether it's actually fighting, but nature actually is trying to heal itself and heal us in the process, right? I don't think even the, you know, nature is being as cruel as humanity is being on nature. You know, I don't think nature is saying, okay, these guys are really being bad to me. Let's be bad. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to survive. And, and, and these idiots don't realize that if I don't survive, don't, they, they will, will not survive. And it could be said, once humanity becomes extinct as a species, the good news is the forest will recover, the ocean will replenish. So don't worry about the planet. Understand that the struggle to avert catastrophic climate change is to ensure 
that humanity can live in a mutually interdependent relationship with nature for centuries and centuries and centuries to come. Put differently. You recently explained um, how the, all nations sort of treat their problems as standalone. And as you said, they won't really um, take action of any urgency unless it directly affects them instantly. Could you elaborate on why you think this understanding of interconnectedness is so important, whether it be for energy, um, um, economics, agricultural systems, um, especially in the wake of, I believe, how the world is becoming a lot more nationalist with, as you said, um, Donald Trump and that particular border becoming much more hard, much harder, sorry. Um, the UK, of course, now to European Union, the sort of the uncertainties of the borders in uh, Ireland and Northern Ireland, um, and of course, the sort of refugee, um, the ongoing refugee issues that are sort of going across all of the coasts of Europe. How, how, how do you think, how do you think we can reinstate that urgency for interconnected thinking and interconnected system between us globally? I want to suggest that the, one of the ways we can do that is not looking in the places we've always looked for, for wisdom. I think we need to be looking at ancient wisdom. We need to be looking at the wisdom of indigenous cultures from the Amazon to Africa to the Maori in uh, New Zealand and so on. I mean, I would argue that the indigenous peoples of the world have had if we had followed in broad terms their logics, wisdoms, and so on, of how humanity had to coexist with nature, not just because it's a nice thing to do for nature, but because we need nature to live. We need the water, we need the rain, we need the soil, we need the food that comes from that. And without nature, we're nothing, right? And so unless we get to a point where people can recognize those interconnections, uh, we don't stand a chance of being able to turn things around. So this issue of intersectionality, of, of, of not operating in silos, of it, it's, it's about just recognizing how the human beings are constructed, psychologically and physiologically. Right? People don't sort of say, this section of my body is going to deal with transport. And this section of my body is going to deal with health. And this section of our body is going to deal with housing. You know, we are integrated beings and we need institutions that respect our integratedness as beings. So people now need to say, if we're going to win, we need to re recognize that the struggle for justice, yeah. fundamentally a communication struggle, right? We have to be able to communicate to the largest number of people in as accessible language messages and so on as possible. We need to get away with all the jargon that's, that, that sometimes we use in the way we speak and so on that alienates people. And I would say on the climate question, here's a challenge for all of us. If the most, I would argue, one of the most iconic acts of cultural resistance to racial injustice was Colin Kaepernick and the other people that started off uh -huh. with it, who took the knee. They didn't write a thick 25,000 page document on racial injustice, right? That the people who suffer from racial injustice will never be able to read, right? Right. Mm -hmm. What they did was they said, let's communicate it in a way that will resonate with everybody. They don't have to be educated. They don't have to have a PhD. They don't have to be, you know, high, well-read. So the challenge for us, we're concerned about securing our children's future and preventing a climate catastrophe. What would be the climate equivalent of taking the knee? If taking the knee was the communication that resonated with people for racial justice, what would be the climate equivalent of taking a knee? And you two guys should try and come up with a solution. In 1969, the river Cuyahoga in Cleveland caught fire not once, but 13 times. Since June 12, 2019, 88% of Hong Kong's 7.4 million residents have been tear gassed. In the 2005 FEMA disaster, all the trailers were assessed to have formaldehyde levels reaching above 100 parts per billion, 
with some at 500 parts per billion, over 100 times the national regulatory standards. In total, there are almost 200 hectares of land occupied by rock and ash landfills throughout the valley. These account for a volume of 34.67 million cubic meters. Phthalates are widely used as plasticizers and additives in many consumer products. Laboratory animal studies have reported the endocrine disrupting and reproductive effects of phthalates, and human exposure to this class of chemicals is a concern. At the St. Crude Oil Company in Alberta, Canada, this sulfur is not profitable to be sold back. Instead, it has been built into some of the largest man-made structures by volume on the world, or monumental ziggurats of waste sulfur. 50,000 litres of firefighting foam containing polyfluoroalkylite substances were released to stop the 2005 Bonsfield fire. In November 2010, Greenpeace published a survey which found that three sampling sites in Sintown, the amount of cadmium in the river mud exceed national soil and environmental quality standards. This includes a sample of river mud with cadmium level 128 times over the limits. The largest iron mine in the world, Kiru Navara, in the north of Sweden, mines the equivalent of six Eiffel Towers worth of iron every single day.